G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Strike like Clayton here. Just spoke with Sarah Lucas. Um, she is an expert in UK pensions, specifically the defined benefit UK pensions. So we talk about how to get your clients out of that because it's mostly unfunded, believe it or not. Um, we also cover, you know, the sort of stuff that she's doing and the way that she perceives advice, what's available, what's up the sleeves of, of financial planners that are looking to provide above and beyond the typical style of financial advice. So hopefully you enjoy. So who is Sun Super? Well, if you haven't been living under a rock, then you've probably heard of them. But just in case you have been, they currently hold the salubrious title of being the only super fund to be named fund of the year by no less than five different rating organizations in one year including Champ West and Super Ratings. They've grown dramatically over the past few years and today have more than $58 billion in funds under management and 1.3 million members, making them the fifth largest fund in the country. These accolades and growth in part can be attributed to their strong and clear focus on delivering the best retirement outcomes for their members. And because they're a profit for members fund, all the profits go back into the business to improve the products and services they offer to clients, including registered financial advisors. In addition, their performance is strong. Their balanced investment option has outperformed the industry industry average over one, three, five, seven, and 10 years to the end of September. And to top it all off, they're a really great bunch to work with. So take the time to find a bit more about what they can offer you and your clients by visiting sunsuper.com.au forward slash advisor. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome, Clayton. It's so exciting to be here. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. Oh, gosh, where shall I start? Um, <laughs> well, I've been in the financial services industry for most of my working life, and it's been almost 31 years now. Wow. Um, I've lived and worked in the UK, in Asia, in Australia, so I've seen a lot of change mm. um, in this industry <laughs> yes. over that time. And it's an industry, I must admit, that I love. I have this kind of love-hate relationship. I've tried to leave oh, yeah. several times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but I keep coming back yeah. and um, and I, I just I think where I've landed is that I just really enjoy using the knowledge that I've gathered to be able to help people get better outcomes in their lives it's it's a very um, it's a very appealing job description isn't, isn't it like uh, you know being in finance helping people get the most out of their life it, it, it is it's not really like anything else you know you, you go to university and you think you're going to be talking about balance sheets and then you end up talking about what people want to do with their life and their deepest desires for where their life can go and 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 there's nothing really to prepare you for for that as an advisor is there I, I think life prepares you for that as an advisor. When people ask me what I do, if I say, broadly speaking, I'm in finance, they almost always assume I'm an accountant um, and that my job is to crunch numbers and look through spreadsheets, when in fact, my job in reality as an advisor now involves so much more getting to know and understand people, really divining what's driving them and also what's blocking them from reaching the outcomes that they're looking to achieve. And then the technical and, you know, spreadsheet crunching really is is actually a very small part of that because that's the simplest part. The hardest part is really helping people, I think, visualise where they want to be and if they're not particularly expressive, articulate that. So it's about really asking great questions and helping them to understand really what's going on in their own heads a lot of the time so that you can help give them the tools to achieve that. That was really well articulated. Considering how difficult it is to articulate what financial advice is, I think that's, that's definitely one of the best I've heard. So, But interestingly, financial advice is only part of what you do. Yes. So... Tell us more about what, what the other things. Well, broadly speaking, um, <laughs> it's, as, a, as a human, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm married. I'm a parent to two, th sorry, three teenage boys. Wow. Um, I have a very large Rhodesian Ridgeback called Jed, um, <laughs> cool. who I'll tell you a story about later. Very cool. Um, but um, alongside my day job as an advisor, I specialise in my day job in advising British people who have frozen pensions back in the UK on what to do those with those because there is an awful lot that you can do now with those that you didn't used to be able to do and a lot of people aren't aware of that. Um, so that's that's number one cornerstone. Number two cornerstone is that I'm really, really interested in how we perform at our peak um, and how to really step up performance, step up engagement with people, step up, step up our levels of achievement 
as a human in whatever we do. And what I've found is that nutrition is the number one hack for getting that right. And a few years ago, after the global financial crisis, um, I'd been at Macquarie Bank during um, the GFC and I was in margin lending, which was obviously really at the cutting edge of of the outpouring of, of the global financial crisis. Because essentially, for those of your listeners that are not familiar with margin lending, mm. it's about lending secured against shares. And of course, a loan would be a fixed amount, but a share value would be a varying amount. Yes. And in the GFC, share values fell so hard that people still owed the money, but they had no collateral yeah. um, to pay back that money with. And as a bank, we were obviously forced to call those loans in. So that was a very stressful time, um, although thoroughly enjoyable for the learning that it gave me. But after that, um, Macquarie sold off their margin lending business and I decided to take a break because I was actually quite burnt out. Um, And I sort of went and sat on the beach for about six months and then I got really bored because I'm a person that has to be doing something all the time. And um, I decided in a conversation with a friend that there wasn't enough support out there for women who wanted to build high growth businesses. Mm. Um, And remembering that this was back in 2010 Mm. And in 2018, now there are incubators, there are pop-ups, there are WeWorks, there are you <laughs> yeah, know, venture yeah, capital. Yeah. There's everything yes. is is it's all happening. It's all exploded. Yes. But back in 2010, there was very very little. And I sat down with a, a couple of other really influential women, and we said, "What is the single one thing that we could change?" that would help high potential women to take their businesses to five to 10 million EBIT per year. And what we identified in all of our research was that women were lacking the high octane networks that would introduce them to the right connections to accelerate their businesses. I mean, we're now eight years on and it's been a very successful social enterprise that's become a registered not-for-profit. We've had hundreds of companies come through our portfolio. We introduce them to very high value networks of people who provide funding and who are willing to open up their address books to get these women introductions to, you know, Qantas or Telstra or whoever is going to be able to accelerate their enterprise. Um, And it's been, looking back on it, it's been an amazing thing to be involved with. Wow. Yeah. That's in a lot of ways it sort of mirrors uh, just being a part of XY for for the last sort of four or five years. I I know what it's like to to do something. You you didn't really set it up for it to make any money or anything, but... uh, Wow, that's really cool. And and I just want to duck into that second thing that you mentioned mm. before. So about getting high high delivery of outcomes from an individual. Yep. Um, I would absolutely say that a part of uh, an advisor's job is to get the most out of the individual. I, I'm a big believer in that. I, I wrote a book on this subject, actually. It's called Fund Your Ideal Lifestyle. It was, I mean, the first chapter is, you know, w- like, what's your purpose in life, which is always, a, I don't know whether I, it was the right decision to start with such a hectic uh, topic, but I remember getting asked from a leadership coach once that question and it changed my life, like, really, and then the more I think about it. Um, and and so an advisor's job is to is to help a client and, and there's tactical ways to do that like this is how you ask for a pay rise right mm-hmm. and then there then there are more strategic ways like what do you want out of life and and having those conversations as an advisor with your clients is is i think one of the most valuable things that we do now you just said something really interesting is that diet is mm-hmm. key to this as well now I I can never say that I spoke to my clients about diet, even though it's somewhat of a topic for me. I like for me personally, I, I think it's an interesting thing. And and for example, I uh, I don't eat breakfast, and I haven't for a few years, so that I can get a a mini ketosis. So, mm-hmm. You know, um, and and that works quite well for me, just as a, as an everyday thing. Um, but I've never spoken to my clients about their their diet. Now, I, I realize this is a different business for you, the, the, the financial planning, but do you, do you ever merge those two worlds? <laughs> That's a great question because it's something that I've, I've been in my advice job for, for two years. Um, and I suppose I'm building a practice within, within a company as cool. a lot of your listeners probably are too. Yeah. Um, and I've kind of grappled with how to integrate the two of them because I've had this sense that they're related and it's only really now that I've I've just arrived at exactly what you just said. And 
because a lot of my clients are starting to approach retirement, are thinking about retirement or are almost there, this is a really key time for them to be looking at how am I going to progress my longevity. There are, you know, there are an awful lot of diets out there. Mm. Um, I say, I guess with a capital D. Mm. Um, some of them work, some of them don't. Almost all of them will accelerate some kind of weight loss, but... Unless it's sustainable and you're embedding sustainable habits, that's not going to last. Yes. So what I try to do is flip it on its head and say, well, your first priority is to be healthy. Yes. If you are healthy, weight loss, if you need it, will happen and take care of itself. Yes. You've got to get, you've got to get the, the paradox right. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Yeah, there's, there's definitely something around um, making things uh, achievable in the long term. It, it, pretty much in anything I do in life, the top filter I use is ease. How mm. easy is it for me to do it? Because I've realized that um, my motivation is not guaranteed. I, I certainly can't be motivated <laughs> about the same thing en enough. And and the fallback from from not not being able to to um, to bank on your motivation is often self discipline, mm -hmm. and self discipline um, I'm okay with. I'm probably on the the higher end of being able to to be self disciplined, but what I have definitely definitely found is um, easy tends to tends to cover all my boxes. So even if I can't bank on my motivation or bank on my uh, self-discipline, the ease of mm. doing something uh, I find is is different. So I always look for the easiest, easiest possible option. So um, so for example, skipping breakfast mm -hmm. uh, it, because I, I looked into a bunch of things on how to be healthy because I'm try I tried to do sober October mm -hmm. right this month didn't work. Mm. Didn't work. I got, I got a week in, and I ended up at a box party. And yeah. I, and oh, I don't. You try not to drink at a box party, and it just gets shoveled down. Especially, you know, with a very close uh, family member. So, um, it, I failed. So there you go. Uh, it, you know, my 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 self discipline didn't work. Um, and and there's a lot of things in life that I that I try to do, but I don't always succeed. But ease tends to be the, the best. So. To, to what you were talking about with health and sustainability, what are some things that people can do that are that are easy and sustainable? The, some of the easy things that you can do are make, make, make good food choices. I mean, that sounds really sounds really trite, but I think think about the plate theory. Um, the plate theory is one of the easiest things to follow. So you have a plate, half of that plate needs to be good quality green leafy vegetables or mm. green vegetables like green beans or something like that. Yes. Um, a quarter of the plate is a fist sized piece of protein, so mm. a good quality bit of chicken or fish or mm. grass fed beef or something. Yes. Um, the other quarter is split between some good complex carbohydrates that are easy for your body to digest but low GI so that they break down their sugars slowly and you don't get that sugar spike. So like Things like, like potato? brown rice, quinoa, sweet potato, mm. um, beans, you know, yes. that sort of thing. Yep. And then a good chunk of fat. Yeah. You know, people are a bit fattest, but mm. good, healthy fat. Yeah. You know, avocado, olive oil, coconut oil. There's The jury's out on coconut oil because that's actually a saturated fat. Yeah, I have heard very conflicting yeah. information on coconut oil. And look, oil. if you're coconut oilist, then take the coconut oil out <laughs> and just stick with the avocado and, um, and olive oil. And like you said, keep it simple. You know, it doesn't need to be up for complex debate. You, you mentioned before that you do a fair bit of work with UK-based pensions. Mm, I do. Um, I'm really interested to know because uh, this is a this is a topic that's quite interesting. Uh, we, we've spoken, we had a guest sort of not too long ago uh, and spoke about this particular topic. Um, and my understanding is if you're under age 50, there's nothing you can do with it. And if you're over age 50, there's something you can do with it. Um, but I don't really know much more than that. Can you can can you give us you know, because of recent changes and and uh, what what's your understanding and, and and what are these things that people can do? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, you're 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 part way there. <laughs> Um, the UK has gone through a massive raft of legislative changes in the last few years. So the first thing to clear up um, is that I get asked a lot, can I bring it to Australia? Yes. Um, by Brits. So I work almost exclusively with Brits here in Australia. Um, 
you cannot bring it to Australia under the age of 55, full stop. Um, the reason for that is in around March 2015, HMRC in the UK changed all the rules around access to UK pensions. And they said, if you are under the age of 55, so sorry, let me step back. The, a lot of the old schemes had traditional retirement ages of 60 and 65. And HMRC said, look, everybody should be allowed to access their retirement benefits from the age of 55. You can only have them under 55 if you have less than 13 months to live, basically. And there are one or two other extenuating circumstances, but they're very, very strict. Um, if you access it before, then you're likely to pay a 55% tax charge. So you, what they then said is, if you have UK tax advantaged money and you want to move it to another country, in order for us not to levy that 55% tax charge, it has to land in a vehicle or roll over in Australian terms, roll over to a vehicle that also applies the same access rules. Now here in Australia, of course, we allow access under 55 in lots more circumstances like financial hardship or releasing property for a first, releasing money for a first property purchase or, or whatever. We're a lot more flexible. Yes. So we stopped complying. So HMRC said, well, okay, all those come off our recognised pension list. Wow. So if you transfer it to an Australian CureOps, we're going to charge you 55% tax. Boom. Boom. <laughs> so what happened was that um, there were some self-managed super funds that were compliant um, and they had to scramble to redo their trust deeds and get them reapproved by HMRC. So if you go onto HMRC's list and you look for, they're now called ROPs actually, they've dropped the queue, but you, you look for approved ROPs. There is a long list of approved ROPs, but they're almost all self-managed super funds. Um, and they have to have a special trust deed, a private tax ruling, and they have to report back to HMRC for five years. So you have a dual tax liability, you have a dual auditing liability, and a whole lot more restrictions on what you can put in the funds in the first place. So most people, unless they have more than about 500,000 and they're over 55, do not want to bring their funds to Australia. It's hard enough to run a self-managed super fund as it is. Can't, let alone yeah. across two tax jurisdictions and two sets of regulations. Yeah, I... I I have nothing but uh, unfond uh, feelings towards my SMSF. And I, I even work, you know, I spent a year specifically in SMSF. And I guess I because I, I knew what was, you know, I, I knew the, the functionality of the actual SMSF part to be quite easy because I was experienced in it. But then, you know, just all the hassle. There's so much hassle when you're the client of one. It just... Anyway, that, that, that's just a personal opinion. Um, but but you, for the people that can do things, what, what, what is it? Yeah, so I think right at this time, there's a very, very sweet spot for people who are in the old defined benefit or final salary schemes. So for those who are not familiar with those, they are essentially a deferred annuity. Right. Um, and the annuity that you will be paid out on your retirement is a function of how much you earned while you were at the company. So it's typically a 60th or an 80th of your final salary at the company for every year of service that you had, um, which means for people who were there for sort of 10, 20 years, that can be incredibly generous. Mm. Um, a lot of these schemes closed in the 90s because companies couldn't afford to fund them anymore because their liabilities were blowing sky high. Um I'll come back to that. But um, <laughs> but coming back to, you know, let, let's take a typical individual who was in one of these schemes. Now, what happens is that these schemes, um, let's say, for example, um, they're offering you £10,000 a year in today's terms. So that's about 18000 Aussie dollars a year at 1.8. Um, what they will say is, okay, so by the time you've retired, how much are we likely to, are we liable to have to pay you? So say so it's £20,000 by the time you retire. Um, you can stay with the pension and you can take that 20000 at retirement date and it'll get indexed every year until you die and then it's gone, unless you've got a spouse and they'll get half, but we'll keep the other half, thanks very much. Um, however, what they are now obliged to do is to offer you a cash equivalent transfer value. Of what the future value to what age? That's right. So this mm. is this is the this is where it That's gets a weird this one. is where it gets really interesting, because they um, they essentially back calculate the future pension on today's interest rates. So what you're typically ending up with 
is a multiple of anything between seven is the lowest one I've seen. And seven times. Seven times your – so seven years of pension up front, yep, yep. which is not really that attractive. Um, the highest one I've worked with lately has been 65 times. So 65 <laughs> years of pension up front as a cash value. How, how, do, they, how do you justify 65 years? <laughs> Well, it's, it's, that's an interesting question. Typically, um, typically the range is about 20 to 30. Yeah, okay. That, so 20 yeah. to 30 years up front. That would so seem reasonable. if you say to someone who's reasonably financially savvy, would you rather have the promise of future income or would you rather have all of that capitalised and have it under your control, which one would you rather take? Oh, it's a, it's a tr- it's, it is actually a tricky one if I think about it myself. Um, I mean, I, I just know how awesome these defined benefits are, mm. right? If you have a defined benefit, you, you live in the dream. So realistically, your only downside is early death. And, uh, you know, does it matter <laughs> if you're dead? I, I guess there's, I guess to well, your- Well, it matters to your spouse. Well, exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> it certainly matters to your spouse. So, um, so, but then on the flip side of that, you're saying, okay, well, we can actually get a big chunk of change here. Um, oh, I don't know. It's a, mm. it's a te- it's a very tempting offer to to put forward. I w- I, d- I wouldn't know what to choose. What what do you suggest? Well, that's what I advise people on. Whoa, so. that is a hard. That is that is very difficult. Wow, that's it, is that is that is that is that, is that a is it always the same thing or do you gauge what they're like as an individual or, or how do you how do you give advice on that? All of the above. Wow. Yeah, so right. So it is really a niche space. Um, yeah. This is why I, do, I don't do anything else. So whilst I'm licensed what? and authorised to do super and the whole gamut yeah. of financial planning, I only do this. Interesting. Um, so I have a lot of financial planners that I work with that yeah. I help them service their UK clients just in this particular niche, wow. just like they'd work with a lawyer or an accountant yes. on a particular aspect. Right. So it's a mix of quantitative and qualitative analysis. So the quantitative analysis is starts off being pretty high level, um, looking at, you know, Clearly, if you took this cash, what level of growth would you need to reach a capital amount that at a, say, 4% yield would give you a reasonably equivalent income and some inflation protection? Mm. Um, And then typically, what are your plans around what your future planning is? So how much mortgage have you got? You know, what are your plans to pay off that mortgage? Do you want to sell the property? You know, what do you need a capital injection more than you need Eighteen thousand pound, eighteen thousand dollars a year. Because when you actually come back to come away from the principle and come back to the reality, eighteen thousand dollars a year is not a huge amount for somebody who wants a decent lifestyle. Sure. But if you know, if you're offering them two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand in cash right now, that can actually make a material difference to their lives. So it's not only quantitative. There's got to be a lot of qualitative analysis that goes into that too. Yeah. Yeah. So we prepare um, all of our Australian advice working through all these parameters. And another really important factor is currency. So if you look at what the GBP and Aussie have done over the last 10 years, there's been a 35% swing in value between the two currencies, between the pair. Um, Now, if you were talking to a client about an investment fund and you said, look, this could go up 35%, but it could go down 35% at any time, would you be okay with that? You know, your client would turn white and would be gripping the edge of the seat. It's a very good point. Mm. Yeah, it's a very good point. So if you if your advice traditionally has been, oh, just leave it because you can't do anything with it anyway, for one, you actually can do something with it. Two, you're potentially exposing your client to currency risk that they're not aware of. In, well, you're in, definitely exposing them to currency risk. Well, you risk. definitely yes. are, yes, yep. 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 and potentially not being able to manage it from, yeah. from where you are. Um, and three, you're completely overlooking all the other choices that they potentially have. Um, so I'd really like to encourage everybody to, if they're coming across people who are in these schemes, to really think about not just putting it to one side and saying, look, just just do nothing with it. You can't do anything with it because you can roll them over. There are ways you can roll them over that are perfectly legitimate and we do a lot of that kind of business. Um, and you can also give your client a much better outcome. Wow. Who, who, who do you so – you, so I'd imagine you would work with a lot of advisors. Mm-hmm. Who, what kind of advisors are you typically working with? 
of all kinds. <laughs> yeah, wow, um, yeah, right. Typically, so uh, probably a, a more pertinent question to answer is what is the typical kind of client? So then we can back engineer that to yeah. what kind of advisor is dealing with that kind of client. So most of my clients are um, early to mid 40s through to mid 50s. So there's an early to mid 40s. Okay, early yeah, early to mid 40s English people that are on that have defined benefit schemes. Yeah, so I've got a 42 year old client that I've just signed um, a transfer for today. Um, who had £275,000, right. um, which is actually kind of mid-size, low-size. Yeah. You know, there, are, there are some phenomenal transfer values. I'm dealing with one at the moment that's £1.3 million. Pounds. Yeah. Um, I could imagine there would be some huge, huge, like uh, present-day value ones. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so that, you know, the £275,000, which is what, you know, call it 450-odd thousand Aussie, just off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, He's, you know, he was a member of a defined benefit scheme for, I can't remember how long, eight years or something like that. Uh, he was paid pretty well. They were one of the schemes that was late closing off <laughs> to new members. <laughs> a bit too, a yeah. bit, a bit too late. My God, yeah. in it, in it for eight years, and they're able to pull out four hundred and fifty k. They're generous, aren't they? Goodness gracious, they are generous, and that's why this is. I mean, there's a, there's a whole other conversation we could have about this space. I don't know how interesting it would be for, for everybody well, I, I, here. Well, I'm a defined but, benefit nerd. Mm. I find them absurd and uh, – no, just absurd. I think I can't believe that governments were thinking this was a good idea. Well, yeah, I mean, it was it was the companies that set them up originally. Oh, this is private. Oh, this is, so no, this yes. is private. So it's this it's wow, important, an important crazy. distinction. So this is um, they're quite different to Australian defined benefit so schemes, the old Commonwealth schemes. So a private company in the UK, mm -hmm. uh, legitimately within the last couple of decades had defined benefit schemes for their employees. Yes, this was my job in the UK when I started in advice in the... <laughs> um, <laughs> and my job was with um, Aon. And we have, we were scheme trustees for British Aerospace, BT, BP, um, you know, a lot of the ex-government companies that were privatised, they all had defined benefit schemes, but you've got, you know, the Marks and Spencers and the Boots. And Do these the, companies the have companies. the funded pension pools? I'm so glad you asked that <laughs> because right now um, in the UK there is a massive deficit in terms of liabilities and Yeah, I'd imagine bases. so. So PwC, the, the big four accounting firm, have an arm called SkyVal, which is a software company that supports the admin of a lot of these schemes. And so they gather all their data from the schemes that they service and every quarter they publish what the level of deficit is in the defined benefit space. Do you want to have a guess what it is oh, right now? Oh, God, no, I don't want to. Tell me. It's £540 billion. Pounds. <sighs> And these are private, or is this private and public? These are company. These are public companies. Most of them are, yeah, all oh, of so, them are so, public so companies. Does, yeah. Is this government and private? No, and no, this is private company. So BP, BT, British, British Airways. A half a trillion dollars. Yeah. Britain's pension liabilities overall to the entire population is seven trillion. Five hundred and forty billion of that yeah, is in deficit. See, that's insanity. Mm. So. Um, from this conversation, I no longer <laughs> would take the option of a, a defined benefit scheme. These companies won't be around to pay. No way. No way. Well, look at Carillion. You know, Carillion. I'm, un I'm unfamiliar. Carillion were um, a big government contractor. Right. Um, who collapsed last year. We were working with a couple of clients who uh, who had Carillion pension schemes who were dragging their feet saying, I don't want to come out of the defined benefit scheme. Um, and we were saying at the time, look, your company's in trouble. <laughs> oh, no, my pension scheme will be fine. My pension scheme will be fine. Carillion collapsed, um, declared bankruptcy. £800 million of liability was absorbed by the Pension Protection Fund, which is a, a, a scheme that's a levied on all government, sorry, levied on all defined benefit schemes to recover collapsed schemes. Um, right. So they've absorbed the liability, but the problem is they only guarantee up to 90% of your pension benefits, up to a cap of about 38,000. If you're in payment already, 
If you're not in payment already, then there's a whole bunch of caveats on what they will actually pay you. Plus, if you read some of the more insightful press, the Pension Protection Fund can't afford to absorb another Carillion. It goes without saying, get the money out, Sarah, get that money out. (laughs) Oh, my God. This seems insane. Uh, They are absurd. Defined benefits are the most absurd thing. I, I just... I don't know. I, I, I mean, if these private companies, it must have been the CEOs of these private companies that were writing it because they said, ah, oh, look, it'd be great for me to receive this awesome pension for years to come. And then, because in Australia, we have the Future Fund. Mm. Um, and I, I, I could be wrong here, but a defined benefit in, 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 a, in a company is really rare here. Like mm. really rare. I think yep. I... I, I, I yeah, maybe Coca-Cola, maybe from from you know decades ago, but um, and I, I could be completely wrong. There might be a bunch of them, but I, I certainly haven't come across a lot. They are absurd. So okay, so you used to work with Defined Benefits in the UK, mm-hmm. and now you're working with Defined Benefits here in Australia. Wow, it's like Back to the Future. That is that is that is yeah. <laughs> but without the big hair, I can <laughs> <laughs> bring back the big hair. I say. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you so much for coming on. I've, I've learned a lot from this. Uh, if, if, if there's advisors that want to reach out to you and say hi and, you know, they, they've, they've strangely got one of these, I could imagine quite rare, but to you they're quite common, uh, how, how would someone go about reaching out to you? Um, probably connect with me on LinkedIn yep. is the easiest thing. So Sarah, S-A-R-A, Lucas, um, <laughs> just on LinkedIn. I think I'm Sarah.Lucas1 or something on LinkedIn. And I'm also a member of the XY group, so you can ping me through the group too. I think, can we ping each other through the group? You, you can know, tag me, I, can't I, you, in I, the group? Yes, I'm not entirely sure. You'd have to ask M. Yeah. Uh, M's the Facebook master. Um, anyway, pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers.